Sony Alpha A7 and A7R. We're here streaming live from the B&H Superstore in Midtown Manhattan to discuss this unique camera system with two very special guests. On my immediate right, my right, we have Brian Smith, a Sony artisan of imagery, whose portraits of famous celebrities, athletes, and executives have been used in advertising by corporations and have graced the covers of many magazines. Brian has written several books uh, to collect these iconic portraits, and his latest one is hot off the press and literally the book on the Sony A7 and A7R. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks for having me on, Gabe. And on my far right, we have Mark Weir. Mark is Sony's Senior Technology Manager for Digital Imaging. Great to be here, Gabe. Welcome, Mark. Um, and again, my name is Gabriel Biederman. I'm known around these parts as the mirrorless man and recently penned the book Night Photography, From Snapshots to Great Shots. We'd also like to invite our online audience, tweet with us at, with the hashtag BHPhotoLive. That way we'll be able to see your question and hopefully answer it during the live webcast. And don't forget, when you tweet with this hashtag, you'll automatically be entered to win one of two Sony A7 cameras kitted with the 28 to 70 lens. And as always, you can follow us on Twitter, at BH Photo Video. Mark, let's start with you. If you could give us a brief overview of the A7 and the A7R, when we look at them physically, they're practically the same, but on the inside, vastly different. So can you go over some of those features that, that differentiate them and why one person would choose one over the other? Sure, Gabe. The, uh, I have an A7R in my hand. This is uh, our interchangeable lens, full frame digital camera that's about half the size and weight of a conventional digital SLR. We launched these models in October of last year uh, and our intention was to bring the performance of full frame digital photography to a size and weight class that allow photographers to be more creative, to capture in the moment, to perhaps take a camera to locations that they wouldn't otherwise be able to. We packed it with our latest technology, including our sensor technology, uh, our latest uh, Beyond's X processor for spectacular uh, performance and image quality. But we made two different models, the A7 and the A7R, uh, primarily for uh, two slightly different target uh, customers. The A7 is our 24 megapixel camera. It's equipped with uh, the latest advances in focusing technology to include both phase detection on the image sensor and contrast AF. It shoots at five frames per second. Uh, it's very light, uh, very quick, uh, can really help you capture in the moment. Then the A7R, you see the R here, is, features our new 36 megapixel image sensor for very, very high resolution. The kind of resolution that you would expect um, from the very finest SLRs or perhaps even medium format. And Brian will tell you about some of the spectacular images he's been able to capture with the 7R. Um, the 7R uses a, it's a very new sensor, very different um, structure, has uh, some advantages uh, for image quality beyond just the resolution itself. Uh, but it uses uh, contrast AF. Um, it's a little bit slower than the A7. It uh, only shoots at a max of four frames per second. Focus acquisition speed is just a little bit uh, not, not quite the same. But again, we find that most um, photographers who are looking for the very, very highest image quality will go for the uh, 7R with its um, increase in uh, resolution by about 50%. But we find that everyday photographers uh, who are looking for spectacular image quality, but at the same time, uh, very usable, very tractable um, uh, camera to carry around, uh, will be more than uh, fully satisfied with 24 megapixels from the A7. So we offer two models, the A7 and the A7R. They're slightly different uh, target audience, but uh, very much um, have the same sort of shooting style and same user experience. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Now, Ryan, you've had the good fortune to try out these cameras a little bit ahead of most everyone else. Why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about your experience as an end user of these well, cameras? Well, thank you. Thanks to uh, Mark and my good friends at Sony for letting me uh, try these out ahead of the announcement. And um, I think when Mark offered up an A7R, he figured I would do a studio portrait shoot, something in very controlled environments where you know everything was um, 
button down and I maybe I something some, safe so, something <laughs> safe and um, I, I think he was a little taken aback when I told him that I thought I'd be taking it down to Haiti but the reason that I wanted to do that is I wanted to see how the camera would hold up under fire like it's very easy to shoot in a studio when everything's controlled but I actually thought I want to see what that great resolution does with fast moving subjects so I took it around the streets of Haiti and just shot what I used to do, street photography. Walking around as a photojournalist, looking for, looking for moments, waiting for elements to come together. So for that, it was a great way to showcase both the resolution of the camera, but also how it would capture quickly moving subjects. And the accuracy of color, movement, everything like that was a great way to put it to the test. So some of the things I would look at was just, you know, a wall might catch my eye and I'd pull over and stop and wait for kind of the elements to come together. And a lot of times really the backgrounds would be the start of an image. I was driving by this beauty shop and, and saw this great wall and just, just waited for somebody to walk into the frame. And I'm not shooting, I'm not shooting like with a high speed motor on this. I prefer to shoot one image at a time okay. and just time it till the subject's where I want. So that's, that's how I determine if a shutter is um, responsive and there's no lag if you can capture the people right at that moment that you want to see them. So one of the great things that I loved about it, it's a very nice lightweight camera. I'd walk around with it at the end of the day, it wouldn't feel heavy. And it really just comes down to seeing. So walking around the streets of Haiti, I, I thought this guy sort of reminded me of those <laughs> acts in Vegas where they saw the person in half. So <laughs> yes. I, I think one of the great things with cameras is having them light enough that you can just capture things as you see them. So um, in addition to that, it gave me the resolution that I was looking for, really, really fine detail. It doesn't have a anti-aliasing filter that traditionally sort of blurs the image mm -hmm. that you have to resharpen. The captures are sharp to begin with, with you know, razor sharp detail and something like this, I'd see the, the grout lines in the scene. And, you know, that was, that was great to be able to combine the, the look that I used to get from medium format digital, but in a form factor much smaller than a traditional 35 DSLR. So for really, you know, bright colors, nice gradations through all the detail, um, you know, walking around the streets and capturing you know, a little bit of the feeling of that street. Again, that's one of the reasons I wanted to take it to Haiti, shoot in subject matter that I used to shoot back in the film days, knew what that was like, but how much easier life is now with a tool like this at my disposal. Sure. Capturing some of the grit. Uh, it's a very beautiful place, but that doesn't mean that while I'm there, I'm not gonna put it to the <laughs> test under fire where they're burning tires to make aluminum pots. You know, waiting for, for moments as they happen. A lot of times, as a photojournalist, you put yourself in the right, in the right scene and then just wait for something to happen. For these things, uh, this was the hotel, the Olufsen Hotel. This was shot with a uh, Leica 24-28 using a lens mount adapter. And just the, the way, be able to capture the really, really fine detail. These guys. And I was driving around and saw this um, church that had been damaged during the earthquake. And it really caught my eye, just the fact that half of this church came crumbling down. And I knew that I wanted a really wide scene on this. So I shot this with the, with the Zeiss 18 uh, millimeter F4 M mount lens. Again, that same adapter, capturing all the atmosphere around it. But then when you crop in tight, it's the resolution is there. So you have all that detail as well. But first and foremost, I'm a portrait photographer. So mm -hmm. even though I'm down in, in Haiti, it's like I'm down there and I want to capture some of the faces. And I was driving around in the morning and I saw this beautiful red construction fence that was set up, almost like somebody set up a red seamless just, <laughs> just for my photo shoot. Uh, so I just pulled over and sort of waited till uh, looking, for, looking for faces as they came up and this little two-year-old boy walked up in his suit and we did a we did a 10-minute shoot everybody started grouping around us and what I loved about this is just really capturing I wanted to isolate on his face so this was with the 55 1.8 shot almost wide open so that the emphasis goes right on the face and you can 
see that as you zoom, zoom in. Uh, the great thing about 36 meg megapixels, as you zoom in on it, it's, it gives you plenty of resolution that if you want to do a double page picture really tight, it's there. You know, and different, different faces again as I was walking around, just kind of, you know, guy on the, the street with a white wall behind him, almost like a white seamless. But again, coming in really tight on this, capturing the look of the eyes, that sort of detail that, that you have to work with. And a lot of times for portraits, it's, if I'm shooting available light, I, I tend to shoot fairly wide open because I want the focus to go on the subject's eyes and face where I want it and let, let everything else drop off naturally. So for this portrait, um, 55, 1, 8, wide open once again, focus on the eyes and the, the wall in the background starts to fall off, yet it's sharp where you want it. You want to put that emphasis in that spot. Also dr driving around, I wanted to show that how overcrowded the hills of Haiti are. So for, for something like that, I needed a longer lens. I took the 70, Sony um, 70 to 400 along with me and shot with the LAEA4 lens adapter so that it allows me to shoot with all the alpha glass I currently have, shooting it, shooting as, it's, as the sun was kind of creating some definition on the hillside. But I also shot at dusk, just as the first light is coming up. You get that kind of beautiful blue twilight as, as the lights come up and, and create an orange glow against the, the night sky. And we were able to make giant prints of these this year. We had an exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History. So for that museum um, exhibit, Dugall made 40 by 60 and actually a few 48 by 72 inch prints from these. So we had prints as big as four by six foot. And if you want to know how a camera resolves, look, yeah. look up close at a four by six foot print. Yeah. And it, you know, it's beautiful. That's, that's what I want is being able to you know, have that resolution when I need it, but a camera that's small and compact and easy to work with all the time. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing some really beautiful, wonderful images. Um, I agree with you 100%. Um, I had the good fortune um, to go to uh, India earlier this year, and uh, I felt that the Sony, and I brought the Sony A7, I wasn't as bold as you are, you know, to bring the, uh, the R, but I felt that either one of them, they are really the perfect travel companion. No, absolutely. I mean, it's like either way you go, you're going to love the experience. Exactly. You're not going to be weighted down by the end of the day uh, by carrying around this camera. Um, and so I brought with the, um, I brought with that camera and two lenses. Uh, one was the 35, um, the, th the 35 2.8 lens, and then the other one I brought with, what, with was a uh, manual focus, a Voigtlander uh, 51.5 lens. And uh, let's get this. Start the slideshow, possibly. Good. Okay, so um, but first, you know, we started with the uh, images. So I, I really like bringing the Voigtlander with. Again, that was my 1.5. That was my low light uh, sort of. You know, I could shoot in any sort of condition um, that was in didn't matter. Uh, like this, that, like this image along the uh, the Ganges River. Um, this was just as the morning is starting, and uh, great, uh, a great lens matched with a wonderful sensor. Uh, able to get some beautiful bokeh um, out on, uh, in the sky as well as reflected in the water. Um, and it was great to just go with that lightweight system. Now, I chose to shoot probably about 80% of my work on this trip black and white. And how I set it up in the camera was I shot, shot raw, so I sort of had that unprocessed file that would be color, but I put the JPEG setting at black and white. And this just helped me view it and sort of get in that, uh, into that black and white mode so that I started to see more black and white and kind of get in that zone. Taj Mahal, just as the fog is breaking, is just that perfect place, that perfect black and white moment. Um, and the A7 uh, was able to adapt very easily to a variety of situations that you might find yourself in when you're traveling. 
um, especially in a place like India where every day or every moment is, is, is quite new and extraordinary. Um, but the focusing was able to kind of really compete with a quick moving action as well and these birds swarming around uh, this boat as well as just a more quiet moment um, with and showing just even though this one, this the A7 is 24 megapixels, it still packs a punch with the resolution and a wonderful dynamic range with the colors. This is an image that uh, I've struggled between black and white and color. I've kind of decided most of my days there were overcast and I just like the, the muted colors, very true to how I shot it. And then uh, the very bright contrast from a noonday sky. We can't really always control when we travel just uh, shooting during the magic hours, a lot of times we're, we're shooting on all sorts of light. Um, and this was just a beautiful image with the yellows and the blues. And that shadow value, I was very impressed with uh, the quality from the sensor retaining a lot of that shadow detail. Dark and rich, but still with detail. Speaking of detail works, that's something that you should, we should always be looking for to kind of you know advance our portfolio. And this was just a wonderful detail shot. Uh, that I took with the 35 2.8 lens. One thing we talk about with sort of sensor sizes, when we put a 50 millimeter lens on a full frame, it's 50 millimeter. When we put it on an APS-C, it turns into like a 75 millimeter. When we put it onto a micro four thirds, it is magnified and appears to be like a 100 millimeter. And we talk about the magnification of the focal length, but not many of us talk about the magnification actually of the apertures. And 2.8 on, on a full frame is gonna look shallower than 2.8 on a APS-C and micro four thirds. So was really able to kind of get that, easily get that slice of focus that I was looking for. And more of the Taj, lots of people, lots of kids. India is an amazing place to kind of boost your portrait work. Um, and this was one, a quickly moving scene where I was shooting one girl, two girls, and then all of a sudden this girl just kind of barraged her way in and said, that's it, you're shooting me. And the focusing and the, uh, you know, the quickness of kind of adapting to it was really, I was able to kind of get the shot and get it quickly. A quiet, rich scene with color. And again, talking light, looking for shadows and details. This is another one I've sort of suppressed the shadows in this a little bit more because I want it to, to be more dramatic, but I was, I, in the original raw image, I was definitely able to see detail in those dark shadows. And back to the portrait work. This was shot on the Voigtlander uh, 50 millimeter at F4, so he is all in focus, but that background gives us that sense of place. <laughs> this was a fun one um, that I uh, stumbled upon some kids playing uh, cricket, and this is where I, I learned that actually when you knock the ball out of the park, it's an out. You know, now I, I thought it was a home run, I was cheering, and the kids come up to me, and I'm like, what do you do, you just lost your ball, blah, blah, blah. and I just quickly picked up the camera and just got this great shot, I really love the composition, the head angles, what's going on. Luckily, we were able to find the ball, so, you know, everything was all good there. Um, I had the honor to kind of be invited into these widow ashrams, these safe houses for uh, these women who are, are in unfortunate situations and spent some, one, a, a wonderful uh, day with them and got to you know, spend time getting to know them and shoot them in their environment. And this particular environment, these houses they're in, there's not a lot of electricity we're operating by window light. So a lot of these shots were 3200, 6400, shot wide open. And we can see in this image, the richness still at those high ISO images um, is seen. Uh, that 35 millimeter is sort of that perfect wide, that street shooting wide that you can kind of bip off around and get those great uh, environmental portraits. <laughs> this kid was, uh, when I asked if I could take his portrait, he ran into the house, so I thought, no, and then he came out with two wonderful chickens, one of them a dyed orange. So that was another beautiful moment. People just are so nice there. And again, back with the widows, um, also an important part when we travel is to share the images. And uh, I also traveled with a Fuji Instax camera and was able to instantly give them a print right then and there. So here we have a widow and her mother, so the mother and the grandmother um, in this scene. And just, they were so happy to have that print, um, capturing that moment. They decided to sort of make sort of uh, the Instax portrait series of these women with their shots. 
Now, most of you might know me as a night photographer, and I got to say, India was a tough place to shoot night photographs. There's really no place to put your tripod. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, the constant barrage of people walking, bikes, rickshaws, automobiles, cows, uh, monkeys, all that sort of stuff makes it very difficult to kind of get the area to. So a lot of the uh, shots that I took were the, of the high ISO uh, handheld, you know, fast aperture shots. And this is one example in Varanasi of just, uh, I, I shot it in a, in a uh, uh, five frames per second to kind of help me buffer that slower uh, shutter speed and get the shot. Again, it was foggy and, and fog and, and night playing against the high contrast light and the lights make something just uh, eternal. And night in color as well, getting a portrait of this. This was my favorite rickshaw drivers um, and uh, they had the most colorful car and getting stepping out and saying, hey, wait a minute, let's get a, let's get a quick, quick portrait done as well. And then when we travel, oftentimes we get the opportunity to uh, see rituals and festivals. And one thing, you know, we've talked about the small size of the camera. Um, and another good point to that, having to be a small camera, is that you don't look like a professional when you're shooting with this camera. So I was able to kind of really get up close to the scene and not have anyone kind of push me away and say, oh, you know, no, no professional photography, none of this here. So it really kind of enables you to kind of work the scene a little bit quieter and uh, nicely, nicely. And this is, we're gonna end with this shot. Uh, this was sh a shot at 6400 ISO. And um, one thing I like to say about digital, oftentimes we're often looking for the cleanest uh, sharpest image, and that's not always the point. In film days, one of the most popular films was Tri-X, and pushing Tri-X to 1600, 3200, even 6400 was sort of a common practice, and embracing the grain, and here I am sort of embracing the grain, giving it more of a uh, character to the scene. So. Wow, both of you, some amazing images, which really sort of uh, express the ideal of what we were trying to do with this camera, to be able to uh, bring the performance of full-frame digital photography into the, uh, into the moment. Some amazing, amazing images. Well, thank you, Mark. And now, uh, Brian, you've also kind of done a little bit more work than just traveling around with the camera. Why don't you tell us how this uh, camera performs sort of in the rigors of a professional photo shoot? Yeah, so uh, since, I, since I have the cameras, I still, I still have my Alpha 99s as well, but you know, sometimes the decision of like, well, do we go with the large camera or the small camera with higher resolution? I found myself drawn more and more to shoot the assignments I've had since then with the um, Alpha 7R. Um, okay. And so an example of some of the things that come up to me is I shoot lots of um, magazine covers. And um, typically when I have those shoots, my job is to come away with, on a celebrity portrait shoot, come away with as much as the magazine can possibly get in the shortest time possible. So sure. this was a cover shoot for Hope Living Magazine, the current issue of Hope Living Miami. Uh, this was photograph Iron Chef Morimoto. I photographed <laughs> him down at the Shelbourne Hotel in, in Miami Beach, the future site of uh, Morimoto, <laughs> Miami. Uh, and I rarely have control over the environment on the shoot day. If I've got to photograph somebody and it's a rainy day, I've got to come up way, away with images. And that was the case on this particular shoot. We had a gray overcast day, but you know, one of the tricks is when you're looking at that gray sky and you're lighting it, is to move your color balance closer to tungsten. Okay, and yeah. suddenly that, that gray sky ended up being like having a bit of a blue cast. As I was doing that, the editor of the magazine was on the shoot with us and kept looking at the sky <laughs> and looking at the LCD trying to like, what, how are you doing this? How is this possible? But we knew we wanted that bright, beautiful blue sky. I also, for this, wanted to have the ability that they could crop the images if they needed to. Things I was doing vertical as a cover, okay. leaving room for cover, cover type. In this case, they actually didn't put a lot of type on there, but I want to know that if I come in tight and they want to do a double page horizontal out of this vertical shot, there's more than enough resolution to do it. As we came in, the detail was really there. This is probably the, because it was raining that day, drizzling, this is the first time that I've ever had to retouch raindrops out of a photograph, because that's the type of detail it catches. But gave us the look that we wanted. 
again for the opener, you know, I've got the I've got the hotel that's still under construction, but we find the angle where it looks good and light it up so it's dramatic. And then one of the things I always tell people on on photo shoots is try to get as much variety as you can if you're shooting a tight portrait. Make sure that you do something loose as well. So we try to shoot really, really tight, medium, and long shots. So for the medium and tight portraits, this is Morimoto photographed with the 3528 against a green hedge, and then coming in tight with the 5518 for a really tight portrait. I've grown to really like that focal length for tight portraits. You're, you're in closer than you would be with an 85 or 100 millimeter lens, but I like it because it lends a sense of intimacy to the shot. And then finally, it also gave us a, a nice groundbreaking uh, breaker for the shoot because he'd been dying to get his hands on one of the cameras. <laughs> I didn't realize it till I sat down and talked with him, but before he opened up Nobu as head chef there, he was, his first gig was actually at the sushi restaurant at the Sony Club in New York. So <laughs> his, his first gig in the United States was serving sushi to people like Michael Jackson. So wow. Wow. Uh, the, the camera was definitely a great icebreaker in that case. Another shoot that I did recently, we were photographing for a French magazine. We were photographing a, a French rapper named Booba. And when I do celebrity shoots, I sometimes have 15 minutes, half an hour with the people. And I had 15 minutes with him. And the idea is I want to come away with as many options as I possibly can sure. in that time frame. So it's actually an instance where instead of having two different sets, we worked with a single set. And I started off shooting with the 5518 going for really crisp, sharp images that I knew the magazine would be happy with. So as you're coming in tight, you've got that sharp detail with that lens. But then switching over from that, switching to the, um, I, I had a, uh, from, from it'd been gathering dust for probably eight, eight years now, but I had a, a Canon 85 1.2. <laughs> and suddenly, with the Metabones Smart Adapter 3, I'm able to use that lens on this camera as well. And there's something like, it's not necessarily the sharpest lens I've ever owned, but 1.2 is that kind of dreamy look yep. that all I really did was put a, turn the pocket wizard off on the camera and shot available light. So using the, the modeling lights from my Profoto strobes, just shooting wide open with that, capturing a different look and feel where the depth of field is really, really shallow and the focus falls like right on the eyes. And, and very quick switch over from that to come away with a couple different shots. So that's one of the things I think that's also important to look at. It Not only do the lens adapters give you more lens options, but they give you an opportunity to shoot with all types of your favorite lenses. So if you have a favorite old Nikon lens or Canon lens that you want to use with these cameras, it's very easy to do so. Walking around, um, did a lot of night photography for, for the uh, Sony A7R Snapshots book. So okay. walking around the streets of New York and Miami Beach doing a HDR shot of the Colony Hotel at dusk. And just capturing different things. I mean, one of the things I loved is walking around with this camera just with a couple small lenses and a, a shoulder bag. It was mm -hmm. very easy to work with. The Delano Hotel at dusk. And again, knowing that I have the resolution with this camera to shoot an image like this, but then I can crop in tight for the, for the Art Deco details if I want to. That, that added uh, resolution that you've got with 36 megapixels gives you a lot of options. And for portraits, this was a, a, a low light portrait we shot uh, this year at uh, CES. This is, this is my friend uh, LD Nauda, um, who was kind enough to accompany me to a bar. Oh. Normally he never, <laughs> never goes to bars, but in the purpose of a, of a photo shoot, anything you know for Sony. So we did this picture I, I picked up, actually here at B&H, I picked up in your used apartment, a used uh, 55 1.2 Nikkor manual focus lens for about 350 bucks. Yep threw on an $88 Metabones adapter, and suddenly we had a great low light lens. 
So one of the things that I'll do for something like this in very low light, the great thing that EVF allows you to do is to use focus peaking where you can put the focus right where you want mm -hmm. and highlight areas that are in sharp focus either with white, yellow, or red details. Okay. Because in this instance, there was basically red magenta light. Mm -hmm. I used yellow as my peaking color and we just focused till we got the focus right there on this highlight in his eye. Another great thing with that lens is I have uh, one of, a couple years ago, Lens Baby came out with, with an adapter called the Tilt Transformer that allowed you to turn virtually any Nikkor lens into a, a tilt lens. And the great thing about that as opposed to other, other tilt adapters or other lenses from Lens Baby is you can get things really, really sharp with whatever focal length that you want. So this was the 5512 macro shot at, at uh, dusk on South Beach, trying to get the focus right in that small point. Same thing right here, just really se selective depth of field. And it's kind of cool because basically any Nikkor lens you could come across, you can turn into a tilt lens. If you want to do it with a 600 millimeter lens, it's the only way I know to come <laughs> yeah, up with right. a 600 millimeter tilt lens. So it just opens up a wide range of other possibilities from this. Wow, beautiful work again. And uh, this is a wonderful segue sort of to talk about the uh, Sony uh, lens ecosystem. So uh, Mark, why don't you talk to us right now about what lenses were, uh, are available now and maybe what we can kind of look forward to in the, the, the roadmap. Yeah, some amazing shots uh, there, Brian. A again, uh, highlighting that the camera does more than just uh, realize a small form factor to put you in the moment, but it also allows you to enjoy the flexibility that a full frame camera with a variety of lens options provides you, as well as the opportunity to shoot with um, a full frame camera that's designed from the ground up to be live view. That may seem like a simple proposition, but it's actually quite rare. There's really only two or three digital cameras in the world that uh, combine the advantage of the full frame sensor with uh, live view all the time. And this allows you to see uh, color, exposure, but even more importantly in the context of a full frame camera, it allows you to see uh, shallowness of depth of field. I mean, one of the reasons why people shoot with full frame cameras is to uh, have uh, very, very sharply defocused uh, areas for impact and composition. And you can't really see that um, through the viewfinder of an optical uh, viewfinder camera, simply because the only depth of field you're seeing is what's on the focusing screen. With a camera like this that's live view all the time, what you see through the viewfinder is exactly what the image sensor is seeing. So when you want to uh, set up a shot with, um, as Brian was mentioning, very sharp focus on the pupil of the eye, for instance, mm -hmm. with uh, focus falling off very sharply on the rest of the face, uh, you can do that. You can pre-visualize it before you take the picture. You don't have to shoot and check and shoot and check. Um, you can get it right the first time. Uh, the design of the lens mount of this camera is uh, also unique among full frame digital cameras. What we did was we used our E-mount system here, which allows the um, lens mount, the flange of the lens mount, to ju just be 18 millimeters forward of the image sensor itself. That's uh, radically different than pretty much any other full frame digital camera ever made, okay. um, which uh, lends to uh, sensor to flange distance is usually 40, 45 millimeters. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a couple of inches. But by having it so close, um, we've allowed not only for use of our FE lenses, these are full frame capable, um, yet at the same time very compact lenses, but we can also mount uh, a mount adapter that we offer. This is our LAEA4, a, a mount adapter that um, Brian also mentioned, uh, which has its own inbuilt focusing system. So you can mount um, an A-mount lens, like uh, one of our Zeiss 50 millimeter F1.4s here. But this is just the beginning. This is uh, a mount adapter for our A-mount lenses. But then on top of that, there are numerous manufacturers offering uh, mount adapters for a whole variety of different lenses. Um, Brian has here, for instance, a mount adapter uh, for, for a Voigtlander. Um, and you can see one here for a Rokor lens. 
Um, and Brian can tell you, actually, I understand that the two of you have so, sort of dueling uh, lens uh, collections. Well, yeah. yeah, I think so. <laughs> so I'll let you talk about we, that in just a moment. We discovered in preparation that our, we not only like love classic cameras, but their lenses. Um, yeah. And there's so many adapters. One other point I want to, before we get to that, um, just also that NEX users, uh, that E-mount mm -hmm. also fits you know, right onto the... Uh, Sure. So this is an E-mount camera. This is the right. E-mount. Um, it is a full-frame image sensor, but nonetheless, it is an E-mount lens mount. It's fully compatible with uh, the E-mount lenses that we've introduced over the last uh, four years for our uh, APS-C E-mount uh, uh, cameras. Needless to say, lenses with an APS-C image circle uh, will crop on the full frame sensor, but different lenses crop to a different degree. Brian will explain his experiences with our 10 to 18 wide angle, which pretty much covers the full frame pretty well. But uh, with our initial launch of the uh, camera, we've uh, introduced five FE lenses. Okay. Obviously, the first one was the 35 F2.8, followed with the 55 F1.8. We've recently shipped the 2470 F4 uh, Zeiss uh, mm -hmm. zoom with optical image stabilization. We also have a 2870 uh, kit lens on the other side there. And then uh, we're about to ship our new 70 to 200 uh, F4 constant aperture G lens uh, wow. for the uh, in the FE um, uh, design that will uh, be a great match for the uh, A7 and the A7R. And, and needless to say, all of these FE lenses can also be used with um, our E-mount cameras for the last four years, uh, from NEX 3 and 5 to 6 and 7. Uh, so all of these lenses uh, are compatible with the E-mount cameras. Uh, we launched five lenses with the introduction of the, of the camera. We committed to offering five more lenses within calendar 14, and then five more lenses on top of that uh, to extend uh, into calendar 15. So we'll have 15 FE mount lenses. We have 13 uh, E-mount lenses that have already mm -hmm. reached market. Wow. Okay. Um, and then there's uh, the roughly 35 A-mount lenses that can be used with our adapters. And then there's the host of uh, other lenses from other manufacturers. So in a way, by making the lens mount um, as close to the image sensor as we have, which is unique among full-frame cameras, we've sort of made the camera that is the universal well, not the universal donor, but the universal, universal recipient, recipient so. of, like uh, of lenses. Yeah, yeah. Right? it really is. <laughs> and by the way, folks, this is the first 70 to, to 200 FE lens right here at B&H. First one in the United States. And so lightweight. I just yeah. was uh, blown away by that. So. Yeah, one of the things that we did with these lenses, the e, uh, FE lenses, is although we could easily make the lenses very large and very fast aperture, you know, F1.4, F1.2 lenses, we elected not to do that intentionally. Uh, needless to say, we have um, uh, plans to offer very uh, fast aperture lenses um, going forward. But by creating a lens like this, it complements the size and form factor of the camera. This is a Zeiss 35 millimeter f2.8 uh, lens, and it's about half the size mm -hmm. of a conventional full frame 35 millimeter focal length uh, prime. So by uh, electing this design, which uses uh, extensive spheric molding uh, elements, we're able to realize a lens that's a great match for the camera itself. So this is an important part. Um, we also elected to you in the zooms uh, to use an F4 constant aperture in this Zeiss lens. And some would say, well, where's your 24 to 70 F2.8? Um, by moving to a slightly narrower constant aperture, we're able to realize a lens that's drastically smaller mm -hmm. than would otherwise be the size dictated by the full frame sensor. But we're also able to do something very important, and that is to offer optical image stabilization. Look around to see if you can find any 2470 F2.8s with optical image stabilization. You really won't find any because they really aren't available. Uh, the size of the elements is really uh, too large to sh uh, in a lens shift design uh, while maintaining a reasonable size. So by opting for an F4 constant aperture, we're able to realize a Carl Zeiss 24 to 70 um, with optical image stabilization. But at the same time, is still a great size and match for the camera. So these are the FE lens. Um, we'll be introducing uh, five new ones 
within this year. Actually, you won't have long to wait to see Excellent. them. Uh, some of them will be very exciting. We've had many uh, suggestions as to what they should be, and I think uh, the people who are making those suggestions will be very happy uh, with some we of the like models. Happy. That, yes, we like happy. Uh, but again, like happy too, right? <laughs> again, the flexibility of the camera and what you can do with it uh, really extends to the lens and the system, and that's uh, one of its great uh, virtues. Mm -hmm. And now, Brian, in your book, you have a chapter on sort of the lenses and all the adapters that you can use, as well as your very extensive articles in your blog as well. The three sort of main ones that I gathered from you is well, there's the uh, photodiox, right. which is sort of a, a basic adapter um, in, a, in, a, in a sort of uh, in a budget price. Sort budget of. price, but yet really, really good quality. Okay. That's what I've got right here okay. holding this uh, uh, Minolta MD lens right there and the build is beautiful on these mm -hmm. things as well but as you said these are probably the most affordable price point okay and then we have the meta bones which i that tends i kind of lean towards them i know you like them a little yeah. bit as well uh, and they offer a plethora of options mm -hmm. as well to go from and uh on the higher end we have the nova flex right which is just sort of the ultimate in machined adapters if there can be such a thing meta bones tends to be around a hundred dollars NovaFlex tends to be in the two to three hundred dollar yeah. range, um, but one of the most exciting adapters, uh, especially if you are a Leica M user, um, is the uh, the recently released the VM to E adapter. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Brian? Yeah, the, this is one that I came across in the course of writing the book, and okay. fortunately it came out in time to include it in the book <laughs> because I like this adapter a lot. Okay. Voigtlander makes this. It's the Voigtlander VME adapter. And the difference between this and everything else is you can, you can still get infinity focus with it, but you can add an extra four millimeters of focus extension through a variable helicoid focus. Now, that doesn't sound like much. I first, when I, I got it and sort of racked it back and okay. forth, I was like, are you kidding me? But it's enough <laughs> with a typical 50 millimeter lens that focuses to a meter, which is pretty typical for rangefinder lenses. They never focus quite as close mm -hmm. as we like, but if you've got a, a 50 millimeter lens that focuses to a meter, you're probably about a half body shot. So waist, waist up is about as tight as it will get on full frame. However, this extra four millimeters I discovered is enough to, bas to basically take it into a really tight head portrait. So fill the frame with a face just with the, this adapter. So if you're shooting landscapes, that's probably not a big deal, but if you're shooting portraits, particularly with normal rangefinder lenses, this is absolutely the, the lens mount adapter that I recommend. Yes, that's it. it's, it's not the least expensive one um, out there, but again. Well, it'll run you about three, three bills, but <laughs> let's put it this way, the, the, the yeah, lens the that it's on is a lot more expensive, exactly. so. And breathing sort of a new life into Absolutely. these lenses. Um, I mean, I actually, using some of the wider angle uh, Leica lenses, I was only able to get two or three feet, and now getting sort of that close focus and defocusing the background. Yeah. Uh, really, really wonderful adapter if you're a Leica user. And again, a lot of those Leica lenses fit with that same form factor. Exactly, because it's a smaller range rangefinder glass, that's a great option. But I'd also mention one of the great bargains out there is any type of legacy glass, like lenses that are no longer supported by current manufactured lens mm -hmm. mounts. The Minolta MD is obviously an example of that, but the same thing with Canon FD. And I think the biggest bargain that you could find today is Leica R lenses, because you have the same excellent lens quality, sure. slightly larger than the M, but you can generally get them for a half to a third of the price of the comparable Leica M. So that's a great opportunity for somebody who wants the, the best results possible and yet at a very good price. Right. Right. So I might add that uh, in the world of um, mount adapters and using other lenses uh, with the camera, um, we do see the user base that has the legacy lenses and wants to have a modern body to fully take advantage of them. And certainly the A7 and A7R represent really the first time that full frame image sensors have been available for those legacy lenses. And yet there's also another um, type of user 
who is uh, well invested in a modern SLR system, not a, not a series of legacy lenses, but uh, modern lenses for their SLRs. And we often get questions about how the functionality of the lens will be with the camera. Mm -hmm. And this really does depend very much on the uh, mount adapter in question. Because modern cameras communicate with the lens uh, not only for iris control and exposure, but also for focus control for autofocus. So there are adapters um, which are very advanced. They actually have microcomputers in the adapters themselves, and they translate the electric signal from the camera, which will come off of these pins here, to the uh, um, electrical contacts on modern lenses. So for instance, a Canon EF lens will uh, have a series of contacts just like you see on this FE lens here, and those mount adapters will use microcomputers to translate the uh, command signals from the camera to the um, receptors on the lens mm -hmm. so that the camera can control the iris and therefore the exposure, and also can control the focusing motor uh, to allow the lens to autofocus. Uh, different lenses have different communications, and that, of course, keeps the mount adapter manufacturers up at night. Um, <laughs> but, the, um, but, but really, the functionality of the lens in terms of autofocus and exposure is, uh, is largely going to be t uh, dependent upon the capabilities of the adapter. Um, right. Most of the adapters that I know are just giving you manually focus, um, which I think, you know, when I s tell people that, you know, you're going to have to manual focus these lenses, they go running and screaming to the hills. But again, we kind of mentioned about That's focus. That's kind of what we always used to do with our Leica lenses <laughs> right, exactly. anyway, isn't it, Kay? <laughs> exactly. Um, but focus peaking, which we kind of touched upon earlier, really does make it so much easier and actually can be more accurate than sometimes focus points, especially in low light, can be. So again, wonderful way to, uh, to, to again, breathe life and use a wide variety of lenses that you might already have at home. So I think that it is now time to uh, announce our first winner of the Sony A7 kit. Okay, and it's coming up. Who's the lucky winner? And it is Philip Sarconi. Congratulations on winning this A7 uh, kit with the 28 to 70 lens. And just a reminder, folks, to just keep on tweeting uh, using that hashtag BHPhotoLive. There's still one more camera to win, as well as lots of other Fun yes. Gifts. In fact, we're giving away books, right? We are giving Peach, away. Yes. Peach Pit is giving away co signed copies of both Gabe and my books today for a, for one of you li lucky tweeters out there. Yeah, exactly. So, so keep, keep those tweets coming. Keep them coming. We also B and H and Sony have also donated a ton of prizes. So so keep tweeting. Um, I think it's uh, why don't we take this now to some of the questions that have come in um, from Twitter. So um, first one I have is from uh, Trevor Chapel. And he's asking, is the A7 light leak issue only a problem with long exposures? Well, it seems that way. Um, we've, uh, we're always amazed about the variety of uh, creativity and photography that people are doing. And uh, recently, one that's become uh, popular is very, very long exposures in very bright conditions with neutral density filters. And, uh, I don't know that camera manufacturers really anticipated had that, that mind, had that in mind. But, but there are photographers um, who are taking very creative images uh, in very, very high light levels, broad daylight, you know, EV20, EV21, um, for 10 minutes or more um, with heavy uh, ND filters. And as a result, the, 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 the ceiling, the, the machining tolerances of the mount to um, lens flange needs to be very, very uh, tight to take out every single possible photon of light. Um, but we find that some of the simulation testing that's been done, where people will take 30 second exposures at ISO 25,600, um, can uh, really sort of exacerbate the problem. Uh, but we find that it's fairly common among uh, a variety of different cameras and camera manufacturers. Uh, it is something that we're paying a lot of attention to. We very much uh, pay attention to what uh, the user community is doing with the cameras, and we are studying it. But we find that um, as long as you're not shooting at excessively high ISOs, uh, you know, a 30-minute ex uh, exposure, a 30-second exposure at high ISO is, uh, is pretty tough to deal with. But we find in most exposures, um, the, uh, the, the problem doesn't really present itself. But we are studying it, and we are uh, concerned about uh, the uh, concerns that have been expressed. So I, I just want to further that I've also tested this camera with my night photography use, where I typically take a high ISO test shot. 
um, in the dark, not during the broad daylight, and as well as then kind of do a longer, minute long exposures um, with it. And I have not noticed that problem. So again, if it's just that high ISO, situation, then that's uh, probably something that uh, can be easily rectified. And as we mentioned before, Gabe wrote the book on night photography, so. <laughs> thank you. Shameless plug, but thank you. <laughs> All right, our next question coming in uh, from uh, uh, MLH. Um, how does the optical low pass filter of the A7 affect video? Well, in general, uh, optical low pass or anti-aliasing filters are designed to provide a microscopic level of blur at the pixel level uh, to reduce any interference from very uh, high spatial frequency uh, objects in the scene, which um, could cause moiré in the uh, pattern of pixels on the uh, Im image sensor. By removing the anti-aliasing filter, something which has become somewhat more popular these days, yes. uh, that can have a negative effect on video. Okay. Now, it's important to realize that the A7 uh, does have an anti-aliasing filter. Mm -hmm. It's the A7R that removes the anti-aliasing filter in favor of higher resolution. Again, it's something that would be a problem if there were objects in the scene with very, very tight weave or very fine repeating lines, which would match the spatial frequency of the image sensor. And needless to say that would be very difficult to correct in video, much easier to correct in a still image. Um, so it is potentially a problem, but that's the case with any digital mm -hmm. camera yep. that has its uh, optical low pass filter removed. So if, uh, you know, if you're shooting a lot of video, we generally recommend um, a camera with an optical low pass okay. filter, or at least to be aware of uh, objects in the scene that might cause uh, a problem. Now, Brian, you've been shooting with the A7R. Have you noticed any moiré patterns? You, you know, there? it was actually something okay. that I was hoping to show examples of how to correct for <laughs> okay. when I did the book. But the first time it cropped up for me after, I guess, about five months with the camera was the last shoot that I did. Okay. One image out of the sequ out of a sequence, I saw some color moiré okay. on the guy's jacket. I was like, okay, here it finally is. I got to let's see what it takes to correct it. And I went into Lightroom and used the, the Moray brush tool. Mm -hmm. And it took me about three seconds to take wow. it out. So it used to be something that was really difficult when I shot with medium format digital backs because you got pattern Moray, which is almost, it's almost impossible to remove that sometimes. Okay. Yep. But with, with color Moray, when it, when it came up, it was very easy. Just if anyone knows how to use the brush tool in Lightroom, Set it for set it for Murray and just wipe the stuff away. So it was much easier to fix than than even I was hoping for. Well, so that's, that's, that's the good, good news. news. Yes, no more people running to the hills for more. Exactly as well. right. <laughs> All right, our uh, <laughs> our next question coming in from uh, Shaz A HP. Um, does A7 have tethering capabilities? It does. Oh sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. both both A7 and A7R are fully equipped for uh, tethering from PC or Mac. Okay. And they ship with our remote camera control application. Um, so you can tether directly. Uh, and if you want, you can also um, uh, operate the camera uh, by any smart device uh, through Wi-Fi. So uh, smartphone, tablet, um, iOS thing. or Android, uh, yeah. you can operate through there. And you can also uh, transfer the live view um, uh, directly to the smart device for remote control that way. If you want to, uh, uh, but uh, needless to say, in a studio application, if you're shooting you know, very large RAW files and you want to transfer them directly to the PC while you're shooting, uh, you know, cable tethering makes more sense, okay. and both are fully capable for that. Excellent, excellent. All right, um, next question coming in. Does the Sony A7 change the mirrorless camera game for other companies? I think this is a great question. Let's, uh, well, I think it does. It's definitely up the ante um, and made people take uh, mirrorless cameras even more seriously than ever before. Well, from what I've read in the press, <laughs> um, I've, 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 I've read the comments of many journalists that have said that that is true. And, uh, and uh, I would say that most everyone takes that as being the case because here we have a camera that's the size of um, you know, 
popular micro four thirds cameras mm -hmm. with a sensor that's not, um, if you think about it. It's four the, times the size. It's four times the size. Yeah. Um, and uh, when it comes to sensors, uh, bigger is usually better. Um, but also with, uh, with not only size, but sensitivity, dynamic range, there's so many advantages that come from a full frame uh, image sensor and that to realize it in a camera this size um, is, is, well, it's a game changer um, in the words of many um, yes, journalists exactly. who have stated that. It's been attached to the Sony a7. Yep. And, yep. And, and I think that that's really sort of what we're about um, at Sony. I think that consumers are starting to recognize that over the course of the last two or three years, camera development has been somewhat incremental. There's been some minor changes in mm -hmm. digital camera design, and uh, I think what our sort of objective is is to break through that and to make cameras that are um, that have never been made before, that provide advantages uh, to photographers that have never been realized before. And uh, A7 and A7R are just one example of that, and you'll see more and more of that shortly. Yeah, and I think you saw examples both in what Gabe was showing mm -hmm. in his work and the things that I did that you can only get with a full frame chip. It's two and a third times larger than APS, nearly four times the size of micro four thirds. And then when you start looking at the CX sensor, it's about eight times the size right. of the CX sensor. So it gives you much more detail, much more resolution, really what the lenses were designed for. So if you've got legacy lenses, you probably want to shoot them the way they were intended. Yes, yes. All right, another question we have coming in from Matt Kirshner. Uh, seems the biggest issue is lens ecosystem. Are more uh, coming? What about third party, Sigma, et cetera? Um, we've kind of really gone over a lot of that. Uh, maybe you were mentioning another lens, I believe, uh, that is a third party. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the first one actually to come out um, since the introduction of the um, A7R was the Samyang has added E-mount to their, okay. their lineup of lenses. And I think right now you guys have the uh, 14 and 85 lenses and the 35 is on its way as well okay. as a 24 tilt shift. Mm -hmm. uh, but Mark reminded me of one that's been around for a couple years now <laughs> that actually before, before this camera even exist, existed, Zeiss was, had created a full frame compatible E-mount lens. Yeah, Zeiss has uh, had uh, CP primes for, CP prime and CP zoom for the uh, cinema world. Uh, which they showed at Photokina two years ago, which are fully compatible with these cameras and fully cover the, uh, the full frame size. Um, it's no secret that we've been very open with the E-mount standard. Uh, we announced that a couple of Photokinas ago. Um, uh, several lens manufacturers have signed up uh, as, um, you know, to design for E-mount and have uh, brought products to market. Uh, Sigma, Tamron, uh, Tokina all have uh, E-mount lenses now. Um, needless to say, the notion that we would make a full-frame E-mount camera took many by surprise. Um, I did hear some people say that it would be impossible to create an E-mount full-frame camera that the lens mount wasn't the right size. Mm -hmm. But um, here we have it. Here we have it. Um, so it, uh, lens development does take a long time, and uh, but we fully expect that uh, those that are designing for the E-mount now could easily uh, shift to designing uh, for uh, full-frame E-mount as well. Excellent. But again, uh, our commitment to develop FE lenses and to introduce them very quickly uh, is steadfast. Uh, okay. We want to make them very high performance lenses. The 55 F1.8, for instance, was recently reviewed by DxO as being one of the sharpest lenses available at any cost. So I think it came out just like a hair <laughs> behind the four thousand dollar 55 um, Otis, Otis lens. Yeah. So yeah. like when you when you come into that <laughs> rarefied air, it's a oh, very very good. Working lens. with Zeiss has definitely been a wonderful yeah. partnership. Sure. So so we are um, we're going to be uh, introducing uh, more lenses uh, very quickly and um, not only more lenses but also the types of lenses. Uh, that uh, uh, shooters are looking for. And please stay tuned because I think you'll see some exciting news from us shortly. Excellent, thank you, Mark. Um, we also have from Robert Mieres, what is the durability and weather resistance for the uh, Sony A7 series? Uh, 
from the introduction, uh, they were uh, not only the uh, A7 and A7R, but the FE lenses are moisture and dust resistant, moisture and dust uh, sealed. Uh, we believe that there was a uh, mistake on a web page somewhere where the mention of weather resistance was somehow deleted from a page and that caused uh, a lot of um, concern uh, about whether or not they were uh, uh, moisture and dust resistant. They are. Nothing ever changed. Uh, but from the beginning, we wanted this camera to be, uh, you know, a camera that you could use very much in the moment. That and somebody could take down to Haiti, for yes. instance. Yes. Under fire Brian's and not necessarily in control, um, <laughs> which, uh, w w which uh, yeah, Brian surprised me with when he told me about that. But, uh, but again, they're, um, they're not designed to be, um, you know, you know uh, immersed in water or anything, but certainly uh, moisture and dust resistance was part of the uh, plan from the beginning. Excellent. Um, another one here, Brent Gerard. How quickly does the A7 catch focus? Anywhere close to the a similarly priced DSLR? Well, the, the uh, again, uh, some refer to both cameras together as the A7 series, and then some think of the A7 as a separate model from the A7R. The A7R, which uh, is the camera that relies on contrast AF, um, uh, focus acquisition speed is somewhere in the vicinity of about 200 milliseconds. It's going to depend upon the circumstance. It's going to depend upon the lens in use. And we find that that's um, quite competitive with uh, conventional digital SLRs, which needless to say, uh, enjoy a separate uh, phase detect AF sensor. A7, on the other hand, using the 24 megapixel uh, sensor, uh, has um, phase detect AF points uh, on the image sensor itself. So it can rely on the phase detection system to determine range and direction of the subject. So it has uh, focus tracking capability, mm -hmm. uh, where, whereas it th then relies on contrast AF for very precision uh, AF. And it can also focus uh, quite a bit faster. Uh, we can easily see 100 millisecond uh, uh, focus acquisition times on A7. So one of the um, sort of trade-offs with the resolution that's enjoyed by the uh, A7R is uh, it doesn't enjoy phase detect AF points on the, on the sensor. So it's just a little bit sm slower than A7, but that's barely perceptible. And, and that's what I found as well. Like a lot of the differences that you hear are really minor differences. And uh, as Mark pointed out, it's more of an issue phase detect takes over when the subject is moving rapidly toward the camera yeah. or away, whereas going across the frame where you're tracking with something, like a lot of what I was shooting, I thought the A7R's focus system was more than fast enough for anything I was shooting. Yeah. Sure. And, and, and again, um, uh, on-sensor AF systems, whether they be contrast or phase, are being developed. Um, literally as the months pass, the material science and device technology is being advanced at a very, very rapid rate. Mm -hmm. um, we just announced a camera, the A6000, that uh, can focus in as little as six one hundredths of a second. But one of the main things to realize is that on-sensor AF, as opposed to um, you know, a separate uh, uh, phase detect AF sensor used by moving mirror SLRs, also enjoys the object recognition capability of the sensor. So cameras like this can recognize the subject that you're shooting, whether it be a person or a, a salt shaker, for instance. And it can combine the object recognition technology with the focus technology to be able to recognize color in the subject, um, luminance in the subject. And it can track um, an object uh, on the basis of recognition that no phase detection AF system can. So we are seeing a lot of advances in focusing technology. Many of them are expressed in these cameras. And I think you'll see uh, more and more, not only from us, but also from the rest of the industry uh, in the months and years ahead. Excellent. Very exciting. Uh, one more we have uh, just coming in from Ed Villanueva. Um, will the Nikon mount adapter for the A7 or A7R provide autofocusing and aperture control? Now, I only know of one adapter that does autofocusing. Yeah, so this gets back to the issue of, um, of the intelligence that's in the adapter, the microcomputer mm -hmm. that's in the adapter. Now, uh, with a Nikon AF lens, um, sometimes the motor is in the lens. Sometimes the motor is in the body. The AFS lenses have motors in the lenses. And uh, the adapters have the ability, depending upon the manufacturer, to interpret signals from the camera and translate them into um, 
uh, signals that will drive the AF motor in the lens. However, if it's an older AF lens, a non-AFS, which relies on the motor in the body to drive it, no adapter is going to do that, at least not that it's been uh, announced yet, because it's rare or never do you find a focus motor in the adapter. The exception is the one that we offer, mm -hmm. where there's actually a drive mechanism. There's actually an AF sensor okay. and a mirror and a drive mechanism here. So there's actually a motor in this mount adapter to drive the AF mechanism of a lens without a motor. I don't think anyone's announced something like this for a Nikon lens. Not for a Nikon. But yeah. no, it, for could it could happen. It could happen. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Nothing's impossible. The other characteristic of a uh, of uh, Nikon lenses is they're generally, well, at least a, a number of them have irises that are driven by a lever. And uh, therefore, yep. if the mount adapter is going to provide exposure control or iris control, there needs to be a motor and a lever to actuate the iris and the lens. Uh, I have seen that in some cases. And we also have that in this adapter as well. In addition to a motor to drive the, um, the lens, there is also another micro motor inside to drive this lever, which can operate the iris. But when you buy an adapter, what you want to check is whether or not it has the AF capability that you're looking for and the iris control uh, that you're looking for as well. Metabones offers one for uh, Canon EF yep. lenses, yeah, for instance. That's the only one I know. Smart, yeah. Smart yeah. Adapter 3. Yep. Okay. And, uh, but again, when shopping for an adapter, consider the lens that you're using it with and consider the capabilities of the adapter. Yep. That's true. OK, we have another uh, from Stephen Radford. What lenses should we get for a beginner just starting out on a budget? So um, I would probably say get the kit lens. Of course, that comes with it. Right. And, you know, that's that that you save the, a bunch that's of That's the money. ultimate budget lens right there because right. you buy it bundled as a kit. Mm -hmm. And then I think one of the keys that I always look at is you're investing long term in lenses. Don't feel compelled to go out and buy right. 50, 50 lenses to have quantity by quality. Mm -hmm. So. Probably the next thing that I would add onto that would be either the 3528 or the, the 55 mm -hmm. 1.8 primes. Are, are great lenses that for the long haul you're going to be very happy shooting with. But don't be in too much of a hurry to buy too many lenses too quickly. Buy quality lenses because they'll, you know, even though every three years or so there tends to be big upgrades in camera technology in terms of the lenses. They'll, they'll endure, endure for decades. So yes. buy good quality glass. I also, uh, starting out with a zoom lens is also a good way, especially if you're beginning, maybe you don't know your focal length. Yeah. Right? So a zoom lens is a good thing to kind of play with. And then when you, uh, in programs like Lightroom, Aperture, you can actually look at the metadata. And if you're finding yourself, hey, I need to back up more, I'm not close to the action, or I'm always stopping at this uh, 35, then get the 35 to 8. You know, get a fixed, fast lens to kind of complement and take your photography to the next level. You also mentioned, again, the, a, a, an inexpensive way to kind of get into it. Maybe you already have lenses at home and use an adapter. That You get a 1.2 lens with the adapter for $400. 1.2 lenses are $2,000. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's, there's definitely savings to be had um, with it. Yeah, I have to mention my support of the 28 to 70 f3.5 to 5.6. Okay. Um, when we were developing the camera, one of the concerns that we had is that uh, full frame lenses generally will cost more than APS-C lenses. And that's not only true for our lenses, but it's true for Nikon, for Canon. Anyone making a full frame camera um, you know, suffers the fact that it's a larger image circle in the lens, it's larger elements, and uh, it's just more expensive to make. And and uh, with the 28 to 70, it's 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 extraordinarily affordable uh, for a lens of its type. And to imagine that a 28 to 70 full frame zoom could be available for the effective price of that lens, the the kit, yeah. for instance, costs $300 more than the camera body alone. Right. And today it's, we're just giving them away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. We got one. One more to go. And we have a couple more questions uh, from one next one up from Stan Friedman. For sports and action photography, is the A7 preferred over the A7R? Yeah, I think that's that's the one instance where if you really do want to capture moving subjects, mm -hmm. it's you know 
that's the instance that you probably the would pick the A7. The, yep. the tracking capability that phase detect that Mark was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say if you're shooting, if you're shooting action photography, that's another. That's an example picking between the two alpha lens mount adapters, the LAEA3 okay, yep. or LAEA4. That's the one time I would absolutely say get the LAEA4 because it does add the SLT technology that's found in the high-end alpha line cameras as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, generally I'm, as I said, a big firm believer of pushing things outside of their box, but <laughs> I think that's probably an example of when somebody would want to pick the Alpha 7. Alpha 7. Yeah, one of my favorite photographers um, always explained to me that he really only needed to take one shot to, to get the money shot. I think you know who I mean. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> that's the great thing when your name is Elliot Erwitt, you can get it in one shot. Uh, exactly. Get it in one shot. You're doing um, sports with Graflex cameras. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So um, for those that perhaps aren't at the skill level of Elliot, um, one, of the, uh, one of the advantages of the A7 is it can shoot at five frames per second with continuous AF. And uh, one of the challenges that the 7R faces is there's so much more data coming off the sensor. Mm -hmm. yep. It's 50% more resolution. Um, it's just difficult to stuff that much data through the pipeline uh, right. that quickly. So it really doesn't have the, quite the frame rate of the 7. Um, and it, it can shoot four frames per second, uh, but that's with focus locked at the first frame. But when you can shoot at four frames, uh, five frames per second with continuous AF, that's a real advantage that's for those point. of us who can't get it in one shot. Sure. <laughs> All right, we also have coming in from Mike Thiessen. Um, is the Sony A7 and A7R video quality comparable to DSLRs, or is the main focus on photography? And I know we haven't really actually touched upon video uh, a lot. I was really impressed just, and I'm not really doing a lot of video, but I did take some small clips while in India, and boy, I was really impressed and impressed with the tracking of the focus going in now, I kind of left it. You know, sometimes with video and DSLRs, you have to only do it in manually, manual focus. Uh, but the uh, A7 was able to perform and track things very nicely with it. Um, but uh, have you guys, ex what's your experience Every, with it? Everything I've seen is exceptional. So mm -hmm. I would say people that want to use it for video, it's like, feel very comfortable with it. And mm -hmm. one of the other things that should be pointed out along with, along with motion, you've also got sound. And this, right. this camera has a lot of, expanded capabilities because of the multi-interface shoe, putting anything in there ranging from uh, a small stereo microphone that you can control the spread mm -hmm. to um, larger adapters that have XLR um, connections. So I, th I think it's a great camera for, for motion and video work. Yeah. And, and uh, I would say that although the 7 and 7R are very good for video intrinsically, I would say that there's an advantage uh, with, this, with the design of the camera uh, that really puts it head and shoulders above pretty much any digital SLR when it comes to video. If you think about it, any moving mirror SLR, uh, when it shoots video, becomes a mirrorless camera. Uh, the mirror lifts up, the primary focusing system of the camera becomes disabled, and it um, behaves or tries to behave like a mirrorless camera. Um, mirrorless cameras, on the other hand, are built that way. They're live view all the time. So they have focusing systems on the imaging sensor itself. Uh, there are a couple of SLRs that can do that, but not nearly to the refinement or speed uh, that mirrorless cameras can do. But then again, the other factor is that a mirrorless camera is designed to work that way. So the viewfinder, the eye level viewfinder, operates while you're shooting movies exactly while, uh, the same as when you're shooting stills. Which you know, means you don't have to stick that focusing loop on the back of your camera and look right. at it here. Right. You can hold it up to your eye and see right through the EVF so, live view. So a moving mirror SLR, the optical viewfinder stops working when you're shooting video. But another little known part of um, mirrorless cameras is that the lens design is radically different from the lens design of a mirrored, a moving mirror SLR. Uh, not only are they smaller, but the main advantage here is um, the AF systems are silent and the iris control is electronic. So that the way the lens operates and the way the lens is controlled by the camera when shooting video is fundamentally different. And then a final um, difference is that no one's yet, well, 
in recent times. <laughs> no one has yet made motorized or what is called in the world of video servo zoom lenses, right? Okay. So not only is uh, focus um, pulled manually, but zoom is pulled manually as well. For the E-mount system, we already have three servo lenses mm -hmm. and we will be introducing some more. So when it comes to shooting video, uh, there are some fundamental advantages which uh, really, really pay off. Excellent. All right, we have uh, Fernando Diaz. Um, can I lock up the mirror on the A7? I think that's a trick question because it's a yeah. mirrorless camera. Well, here, let, <laughs> let me see if I yeah. can find it. <laughs> okay. But I think, you know, he's asking, I guess, to make sh steady shots for longer exposures, which, again, the benefit of these mirrorless cameras, there don't have no to worry mirror. about Yeah, there's no mirror to lock up, so we locked it up for you. <laughs> um, Laura O'Rourke, um, I've got two crazy kids. Will I be able to use an A7 to capture them? What about when they start sports? So I think eight kids and sports go hand in hand. They're, they move quick. <laughs> when Laura says capture her children with the camera, I hope she means photographically. Right. So. <laughs> right. Well, there, there's a little. They're running fast. Yeah. No, you I think it'd be. Net. Yeah. <laughs> so Laura, I think it'd be a great camera for that. It's like it's it's designed to move to mm -hmm. f photograph fast moving subjects. I'd say you know probably start with the with the kit lens because mm -hmm. it gives you the zoom capability, but you know, eventually you're going to want bigger lenses than that when they <laughs> make it into their first professional sports team. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, A7's a great choice, um, and with uh, face detection, you can even register your child's face right. so that the camera can recognize your child's face and distinguish your child from other children. And know which one to focus on, because we know who really counts. <laughs> yep. Exactly. All right, we have another new one coming in from Bill Reef. Um, highest usable ISO before noise is noticeable on an A7. Brian, do you want to, what's your experience? I think, experience? you know, that that's a matter of taste. I mean, okay, like yeah. how much, like I'm used to the film days seeing mm -hmm. grain. Right. And I, we, you were bringing that up where mm -hmm. sometimes it's actually, you know, something that gives, gives an image a little bit of depth and realism. So, yeah. you, you know, to me, I, I like the look at 6400. Some, some other people, you know, 12,000, 25,000, they're good with. Um, I think it's all just really a matter of taste. I will say this is, of the cameras I've used, this has the best high ISO capabilities of any that I've come across. And I'd also say there's very minor differences between the cameras. So that's probably not a deciding factor between 7.7R. I actually kind of see them sometimes leapfrog where, well, maybe one's a little bit touch better at 1600 sure, sure. right the other one oh maybe a little bit better at 64 so they're very very close but i think they both do a really good job yeah i was impressed at 1600 there was very little noise yeah, which I'm, 1600 yeah film not, well even <laughs> even yeah. even like at 32 there's very little there's there's very little at 32 and as it starts to creep in about 64 i i find it just basically looks like film grain and not yes, right. from that high in iso maybe right. more like 400 or 800 it's got film an over process smudgy yeah. grain. Yeah. And this is another area where the very large sensor comes in. Yep. It's it's almost common these days for APS-C SLRs to have 24 megapixels, so to have a sensor that's two and a half times the size uh, in area um, gives you a, a great advantage. But just as a little perspective, imagine the days when we were shooting Tri-X Pan at ASA, we didn't know what ISO <laughs> meant in those days. Uh, ASA 400 and trying to make the make the D76 hot enough to be able to shoot at ISO 16, ASA 1600. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. and, and that was one, just a few years ago. And, and one other point that I would make, no matter what camera is, but particularly with, with these cameras I've noticed, is like the best piece of advice I give people if they want the best high ISO performance is shoot raw, and turn off all in-camera noise reduction. Good point, yes. Because any system that you look at, in-camera noise reduction is basically going to give you one flavor of noise reduction. Mm -hmm. They kind of have to hit a compromise that it is best for everybody, but maybe not best for anyone. Mm -hmm. So I think being able to control that in post, I turn off, turn all that stuff off in camera, mm -hmm. and then I use Lightroom or Capture One okay. to adjust it in post. And, that's when you're really going to be able to fine tune noise reduction to your taste. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Um, we also have another one, Mike Butler. 
Uh, is there a time lapse feature in the A7? Um, we don't build an intervalometer into the camera. Okay. There is no you know, line in the menu system for it. Uh, however, we do have a very sophisticated um, time lapse uh, uh, shooting uh, camera app. And okay. uh, A7 and A7R are both enjoy uh, the use of our uh, Play Memories camera app system introduced in our NEX uh, 5R and uh, NEX 6 a couple of years ago. Perfect. And um, so it's an app that you never leave behind in your bag because you forgot <laughs> right. to pack it yep. for your trip. <laughs> right. so. it's, a, it's a downloadable app, yes. and we've recently updated it uh, to include uh, live exposure control. So the camera is allowed to meter and adjust exposure uh, in between uh, shots, which uh, oh, very is very, very for valuable for sunrises, sunsets, sure. and things mm -hmm. like that. Great. So oh, the yeah. answer is yes. Just download the app, which yep. is free. Uh, no, I think it's no, I think it's oh. ten bucks. I think it's ten bucks. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So it's uh, still cheaper than most intervalometers out there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, Cole Mellet, uh, does Sony A7R support Pocket Wizard and most ca uh, common off-camera flash systems? Now, Brian, you yeah. use lighting yeah, no. with your no, exactly. So, yeah. so I'll, you know, if I'm not walking around the streets of Haiti, almost <laughs> everything else that I do tends to be lit portraits. So, yes, Pocket Wizards work great. I happen to be using Pocket Wizard 3, uh, but the Pocket Wizard X are virtually identical technology. The multi-interface shoe is basically the inter industry standard shoe with additional connections for, for sound. So okay. it will work with anything that's got an industry standard shoe, including Pocket Wizard, Radio Popper, yep. or one of my favorites, tiny triggers, so okay. there you go, lots yeah. of options. Yeah, anything that picks up the sync signal from the center terminal in an ISO shoe uh, is going to be compatible with this camera. Excellent. Um, I think that is our last question, so we're going to wrap it up with the uh, last prize winner. Here it is. Come and get it. Who's the winner for the Sony A7R kit? Drum roll, please. Dun, 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 dun. It's Lisa Lejeune. Oh. Um, congratulations, you've just won an A7 kit with a 28 to 70 uh, lens. So again, congratulations. Gentlemen, I would like to thank you for joining us here today. Um, it's been thank a pleasure, uh, very informative and inspirational. So uh, I wanna thank you for that. I wanna thank the audience uh, for participating. And uh, the questions, if your question didn't get answered, don't worry, B&H will be answering all your questions in a matter of moments. So thank you for your time, take care.